All right. So um, I'm a specialist in child abuse and neglect. And I work at the child abuse program here at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. And a lot of people wonder, how in the world is it that a child abuse pediatrician became interested in safe sleep? And the answer is that I have been participating in child fatality reviews for, the, for over a decade. And a lot of people will think to themselves, wait a minute, why would anybody ever want to look at child deaths? Because there's no denying it can be terribly, well, it's a terribly sad um, problem, but certainly children do die. And the purpose of child fatality review is to systematically look at the deaths that occur in children and, um, and I've been participating in the regional child fatality review in the Hampton Roads or southeastern Virginia region. Um, and when we look at those deaths, what we can do is look at the factors that contributed to the child's death with the goal of prevention of other deaths. And so that's how I became interested in safe sleep because there are usually at least three to four infant deaths in unsafe sleeping positions or unsafe sleeping conditions with every single meeting we have of our Hampton Roads Regional Fatality, uh, Child Fatality Review Team. And it's something that is always just awful, and it's something that's usually preventable. And so along with Dr. Gunther, whom you'll hear from soon, um, we started to collaborate on talking with people about the necessity for safe sleep. And so I'm going to talk with you, I'm going to show you some information and some statistics. Let's see. So first, when we look at sudden unexpected infant death, and um, I'll talk about what these definitions are in a, in a moment, um, we can break it down by into its separate causes. And sudden unexplained infant death is is a diagnosis in infants under one year of age. And this diagnosis is made in cases in which an autopsy does not reveal a definitive medical diagnosis or traumatic cause of death. And the circumstances suggest that there was an associated risk factor such as an unsafe sleeping condition. And so you can see that in 43% of those cases, or almost half of them, SIDS was diagnosed. And SIDS is um, the sudden death of an infant less than one year of age where there's no associated risk factors. You can also see when looking at the breakdown of these causes of death, um, when infants were given this SUID or sudden unexpected infant death classification, that one quarter of them were due to accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. Looking at the trends in what kind of diagnosis was made in these infant deaths, you can see there's been a huge shift in the trends over the last 25 years. For the only, and 2015 is the most recent year for which we have this kind of data. But you can see that there's been a significant increase, a 20-fold increase, in the number of deaths that were diagnosed as being caused by accidental suffocation or strangulation in bed. That's the green chart at the very bottom of this, um, at, at the very bottom of this graph. Um, and then when we look at the burgundy line that's labeled for sudden infant death syndrome, we see that there were about 130 of these deaths per 100,000 live births in 1990, but the number of SIDS deaths has plummeted over the last 25 years. And a big contributor to that is the Back to Sleep campaign, but also there's been a shift in the definitions that are applied to SIDS and SUIT. And that's also contributed to the decline in the number of deaths that are called SIDS. When we look at death rates by ethnicity or racial group, we see that there's a significant variation between ethnic and racial groups. The, on this chart, when you look at the graph that's closest to the left, um, that's for Native Americans and Alaska Natives, and you see they have very high mortality rate from sudden unexpected infant death compared to all the other racial groups that are shown in this chart. And right beside them, almost as high, are those of non-Hispanic blacks. And then compared to um, non-Hispanic whites, the deaths that you see in non-Hispanic blacks and in Native Americans are almost twice as high. And then um, 
such deaths in Hispanic or Asian and Pacific Islander infants are significantly lower even than in non-Hispanic whites. But there's this huge variation by ethnicity, and we're still working on figuring out why that is. But any effort in education regarding safe sleep environments has to be directed toward Native Americans and to non-Hispanic blacks. So I wanted to talk with you about the findings of the State Child Fatality Review Team. And I've, um, I had mentioned that I sit on the Regional Fatality Review Team, um, which focuses on deaths in the Eastern Region and the Hampton Roads and surrounding areas. However, there is an overall State Child Fatality Review Team, which looks at deaths overall in the state of Virginia. And they don't look at every death of every child each year. Instead, what they do is look at a specific focus area each year. And in the year 2014, they focused on the deaths that had occurred among children in an unsafe sleep environment during the year 2009. And so 2009 sounds like a really long time ago, but actually the information that they provided is very relevant today. And so in the year 2009, 119 infants died in an unsafe sleeping environment or died in a, a sleep environment. Um, and so um, they focused on the factors that were associated in those deaths, and they looked at what conditions existed during each of those deaths. They took a very close look in order to find what factors were in common and how we could go about prevention of such deaths. The findings of the committee was that 95% of the sleep-related deaths, of those 119 deaths, were definitely or probably preventable, and 90% of those deaths were related to an unsafe sleeping environment. So you can see that many, many tragedies could have been prevented by implementation of safe sleep environments. And I'm just briefly looking at some of the, um, like, uh, some of the um, information on death rates in the state. You can see that in the western region of Virginia, there's a significantly higher rate of infant death rates compared to the northern region. In fact, the northern region is lower than, substantially lower than anybody else when it comes to infant deaths. And it's because they have really great education programs that are offered at every birthing hospital in the region, which has significantly decreased the rates of infants who die in an unsafe sleep environment. And it's certainly a model that needs to be implemented statewide. So looking briefly at the findings of the Virginia, uh, sorry, of the Virginia State Death Review, um, looking at infant deaths from the year 2009, 60% of these babies were on their stomach, 73% of them were on a surface that was not intended for infant sleep, such as a couch or in a chair or um, in an adult bed. And then 20, surprisingly, 27% of them were sleeping in a crib or a bassinet or portable crib. And um, we'll talk more about how that was unsafe. What they found was that black infants were more than twice as likely to die in an unsafe sleep environment compared with white infants, with male infants one and a half times more likely to die than female infants. Many of these infants did have secondhand smoke exposure with more than 70% of them being exposed. And then most of these infants, three quarters of them, were less than were four months of age or younger. Bed sharing was a significant factor. A young mother was also uh, an associated factor. And about a third of the babies who died were first children for their mothers. Half the moms smoked during pregnancy, and one of the people with whom a baby was sleeping was impaired by alcohol or drugs. And nearly a third of these babies were premature. So what have we done with regard to responding to this huge problem of infant deaths in an unsafe sleeping condition. Um, there is definitely a program through the Navy, and a link has been provided so that you can look up more information about that program for military families. Also, the program Sleep Tight Hampton Roads does provide cribs or bassinets for infants whose families do not have them. However, I did want to make a note that one of the findings of the Fatality Review Committee was that the majority of these babies did actually have 
a bassinet or a crib, but it was not being used for sleep. Sometimes it was being used for storage, and sometimes it wasn't assembled or set up for the infant's use. And that's certainly related to crowded living conditions. Many of these children were found in um, living conditions in which there were multiple family members or sometimes multiple families in one household. And when space is an issue, we certainly need to work with families to help them find safe solutions for infant sleep, which don't, um, if their crib or if their bassinet can't be set up because of space limitations. One thing I often tell families is that you can empty out a dresser drawer, lay it on the floor, put a bassinet liner or a bassinet mattress into it, you know, those thin little foam mattresses, and then you can have a safe place for baby to sleep. Finding a safe place for baby to sleep doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to take up a lot of space. Safe Sleep Virginia is also a terrific resource for educating families and the Safe to Sleep campaign is, a, is an effort through the um, National Institute on Child Health and Development through the National Institutes of Health to educate Safe to Sleep champions throughout the country who can bring the message of safe sleep to their communities. And I'm actually a Safe to Sleep champion for the Hampton Roads region. And what does the Safe to Sleep campaign involve? It involves emphasizing the three major points of safe sleep, that a child should sleep alone, not with anybody else, even, not even with other children, but they should have their own separate sleeping space. They should be laid to sleep on their backs every time they go to sleep, whether at night or for naps. And they should be in a crib or in a bassinet or in their own separate sleeping space without any pillows, without any toys, and without any loose bedding. There are also multiple other recommendations that came out of the Safe to Sleep campaign, including the avoidance of second-to-hand smoke, use of cool room temperatures, and pacifier use. And the link on the webinar is a place where you can go to find out all of the specific recommendations of the Safe to Sleep campaign. And that brings me to the information provided by Dr. Gunther, Assistant Chief Medical Examiner with the Tidewater District in Virginia. Before we get started with that, we're going to keep on going, um, and we're going to do a poll. Um, this poll should be up on your screen that talks about where have you seen at the fleet. So I'd just like you to take a minute and click on some of your responses for that. You can click more than one response. And a lot of responses are being posted up there. Okay, so it seems as if um, there are a lot of responses that deal with the crib or bassinet. Um, 68 responses, 50 are the pack and play um, that people have seen children or infants um, in. And then a swing or bouncy seat, um, we see that quite a bit. Um, on a bed with an adult, um, either on the couch or chair and on the floor, and then there are other ways, too. So as we move forward, Paul is going to introduce our speaker, and we'll find out some more information as to how this plays into um, it. Paula? Thank you, Rochelle. So now we would like to introduce Dr. Gunther, who will be speaking. Um, the floor is all yours. Thank you. My job is to do autopsies for the Commonwealth my primary job is to do autopsies on homicides, but I also autopsy people who have died in suspicious, unusual, un or unnatural ways. And one of the statutes of the Code of Laws of Virginia specifies that I will do an autopsy on all children under the age of 18 months who have died at home for, with no explained cause. That's an awful lot of children. 
The first time I ever did an autopsy on a SIDS infant was way back in 1994. I said to myself, geez, this is a tragedy. This baby is perfect. The autopsy doesn't show anything wrong. I guess it must just be some awful natural problem. That was before we knew anything about safe sleep. I want to tell you three things about autopsies you might not know. First of all, they don't always give you the answer. Ducky on NCIS never says, well, geez, I don't know why the guy died, and that's how I know he's fake. Because one out of five of the cases that I autopsy, I come out going, I've done a complete autopsy, and I don't know why this baby died. I don't know why this person died. Second, you can't tell from an autopsy if a baby has suffocated. Most people have no idea that's true. But a baby who has suffocated face down in a soft pillow on a couch or in a bassinet with their face in a stuffed animal, there is absolutely no sign for me to identify. Even wedging doesn't show any signs at autopsy. Here's the third thing. Those proportion of deaths that Dr. Clayton, my colleague, was talking about, where they were sure that they died from wedging, how did we know that? Not from the autopsy. We knew that from the dull scene reenactment where an investigator went to the parents with a doll and said, please put this doll the way you last saw your baby alive, the way you found your baby. That's how we learned that wedging was taking children's lives. So we're still not sure how many of these children are suffocating because you can't see it at an autopsy. Almost every week of every month in the Tidewater region, an infant dies not even looking at statewide statistics, just looking at what I face with my colleagues every year. I counted the autopsies of children under a year of age that we autopsied. That's a lot of dead babies. The first time I saw a case like this, I said, how sad. The tenth time I said, how frustrating. Why are these children dying? It's been more than 400 times now and I'm getting mad. I do not want to see these children die anymore. I don't know what it is about being face down that kills them, because I can't tell if they suffocated. But I know they sure don't die face up. Maybe one or two or three children every year who die suddenly dies face up. You think if we put all these babies on their backs to sleep, we could have 40 deaths a year saved? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I have to do their autopsies because you can't tell from the outside if a baby has been murdered. You sure can tell from the inside. All you have to do is open up the skull and see the blood all over the brain and look in the backs of the eyes and see the retinal hemorrhages and look in the chest and see the rib fractures and you know if a baby's been shaken to death. It's that easy. But the babies that die from unsafe sleep, there is nothing for me to find at autopsy. They look perfect, except they're dead. They are perfect little babies. They are mostly one month old, two months old, three months old, four months old. I don't see many who are seven months old. I don't see many who are nine months old. I don't see many who are newborn. And they have one thing in common. They've all been sleeping belly down. And most of them have been in unsafe sleep situations. Co-sleeping with other people on a bed that's guaranteed not to be safe for a baby belly down on something soft, soft bedding in the crib with them, beds that are not meant for tiny babies like a water bed, pillows and stuffed animals. What do we mean unsafe sleep? We mean we think they're suffocating, but we can't prove it because you can't tell from autopsy if a baby died because they couldn't breathe, and we're never sure. If these babies are dying from some unknown natural disease, the CDC is trying to find out, we'll never know. But we do know one thing, they don't die if they aren't belly down. Whoever took this picture probably meant people look at it and go, aww. If you're with me and with Michelle, I hope by the end of this lecture you'll say, oh no, don't sleep like that. It's dangerous to the baby. What is unsafe sleep? I have seen children die in so many positions. I have seen swaddled children who were placed on their sides because they have a little reflux, 
who made some kind of motion in their sleep fell face forward and smothered. We think they smothered. We don't know. I've seen children slide down in car seats. I've seen children slide down in swings. And I've seen awful things happen when tired parents go to sleep next to the baby. So when a baby dies at home, that child comes to the medical examiner's office for me or one of the other two doctors I work with to do the autopsy. That's three of us together responsible to autopsy 40 babies a year on average. If it's homicide, I will find horrible injuries. Let's not think about that. If it's accidental death from maybe suffocating, I will find nothing wrong at a complete autopsy, getting all the medical records, including birth, culturing, looking for infection, full brain examination, nothing. It is so frustrating after 400 of them. Examples from real life. Our investigators are medical legal death investigators. They go out to the scenes and they talk to the parents and give them the doll and they photograph. Here's a bed where an infant actually died. Do you think this is a safe sleep situation? Or is there fluffy stuff all over this crib that shouldn't be there? Parents don't put your babies to sleep with fluffy stuff. It does not make them happier. It carries a risk of death. I like to say if these parents had a crystal ball and they could look in that crystal ball and see that if they put their baby to sleep in this crib with this fluffy stuff belly down that that baby would never wake up, they would never do it. If that baby was crying and cranky from a cold that made the baby irritable and the only thing the tired mother could think of was to put the baby in bed with her, if the crystal ball showed her that when she woke up her baby would be dead, would she do it? Never. Never. But they don't have a crystal ball. Dull scenes completely changed what we thought about these deaths. Because when you ask the parents, they don't tell you these details. But this is the doll that the parents placed in that actual crib. Face up when placed, found face down. Look how soft that mattress is. Look at the folds of the sheet underneath that baby's face. Do you think that baby could have suffocated? I need to take you a long way back in history. This is a very, very old picture of a baby. Is he alone in his crib? Uh-huh. Is he in an approved crib? Well, we wouldn't call it an approved crib now. But yes, back then it was. Is he face up? What are those three things we want to hear about a baby's sleep? Alone face up in a crib. Alone face up in a pack and play. Alone face up in a bassinet. Alone with no one else sleeping with him. Face up in a safe sleep environment for babies. Because we won't see many deaths if they sleep like that. Do you remember ever seeing a cartoon where an anxious father is looking through glass at all the babies in the maternity ward? Weren't the babies always face up, right? They never show those babies sleeping belly down, do they? That's how it was. This is a picture from the 1930s. Babies were always put to sleep face up. Wow, when did that change? Dr. Benjamin Spock corrected a lot of terrible excesses. There was a method in the 1930s based on some opinions of some German nurses and doctors that said you should wake the baby every three hours and feed them whether they liked it or not and put them back to bed and ignore their crying. You weren't supposed to be a good mother if you didn't do this. Well, Dr. Spock said something wonderful. He said you know more than you think you do and suggested that people could relax some of those firm rules of parenting. His book went through innumerable editions. I can't even tell you how many copies of his book he sold, updating it regularly for 30 years. But in 1957, he made a terrible, terrible mistake. He said, I don't think you should put the baby on his back to sleep because if a baby who's on his back vomits, he's more likely to choke on the vomit. What made Dr. Spock think so? Nothing, really. Back then, you didn't have to have evidence-based medicine. You didn't have to have evidence. You could just say so 
and people believed you. You said, I'm a pediatrician, and I think so. Did he have any anatomic studies? No. Did he actually know the anatomy? No. He just said so because he thought so. Is a baby more likely to choke on its back? I owe these two slides to the Baltimore Ambassador Campaign for Safe Sleep. No. Look at that baby face up. There's his airway towards the top and his food behind it. When he spits up in his sleep, it has to go against gravity to get into an air, bay, an air pipe. A healthy baby will generally turn his head so that spit up goes out of his mouth, not down his throat. Stomach sleeping is dangerous for babies. This is the actual anatomy. A baby who's got reflux is more likely to inhale it belly down, face to one side. Dr. Spock didn't know that. Because young babies are what we call obligate nose breathers. You see that beautiful tiny nose? That is a living baby, by the way. Babies that small, how small is that? Before four months of age, they have to breathe through their noses when they're asleep. Can they breathe through their mouths when they're crying? Sure can. Anybody ever hear something that sounds like this? <laughs> that is breathing through your mouth while you're crying. They can do that. But when they're asleep, if they don't breathe through their nose, they can't breathe at all. So anything that interferes with breathing through the nose might cause them to die if there's any kind of pillow or soft blanket pushing up against their nose. Smoking from the parents might interfere with breathing through the nose. You have no idea how tiny those little passages are. I have a Q-tip. It's a special Q-tip on a wire. It's not even on a stick. And I have to put that special Q-tip up their nose to look for viruses. I can't always get it through their nose. It is so tiny. If the mucosa inside their nose swells up in reaction to the cigarette smoke in the air, that might interfere with breathing. might narrow the passage anyway. When they start being old enough to eat cereal, the risk of sudden unexpected or unexplained infant death drops. Because before then, the reason that they have to breathe through their noses in their sleep is when their mouths relax, the top of their tongue touches their palate. Go ahead and try to touch the middle of your tongue to your palate. Get this eye. You can't even do it, can you? That's me trying to say you can't even do it, can you? That's because they've got to make a seal around the nipple so they can suckle. Once their mouths outgrow that, then they begin being able to breathe around their tongues in their sleep, and the risk of death drops. People in the field began to be aware epidemiologically in the 1970s that lying on your belly was associated with death. By the way, there's a mnemonic for prone and supine. Prone has the word on in it, prone, on, that means on your belly. Supine has the word up in it, think of face up. Nobody knew why lying belly down caused all these deaths, but they did think they could change it with the back to sleep campaign because it worked. And you know, they went to Dr. Spock and they said, we think it's killing infants, and it took him seven years to change his book. I don't know why. Here are some recreated Office of the Chief Medical Examiner versions of doll scenes. These are typical characteristics seen repeatedly at scenes by our investigators. We didn't have a crib, so we couldn't show you many of the deaths. In this picture, a PA student is showing how a mother laid her baby down on soft bedding on an unsafe bed. That's placed. She thought he was safe. If she'd had a crystal ball, she would never put him there. That's how he was found. Did he suffocate? We think so. Why? because he's an obligate nose breather and any kind of push against his nostrils could kill him in his sleep. Do they cry when this happens? They do not cry. They do not cry. The parents say over and over and over, there was no sound. She did not cry. He did not cry. I like to say they don't cry. They just die. Four-month-old napping on a couch. There's a pillow up top. Placed found. They don't cry. They just die. This is a really terrible one. This mother said, I fell asleep. I didn't even know I fell asleep. I was just lying on the bed watching him sleep. I was watching him breathe because he was such a miracle to me. 
Her sister came in the room, saw them both asleep, and what did she see? Mama's knee on the baby's chest and the baby blue and not breathing. She screamed. It was the sister who did the dull scene because the mother couldn't. How does the knee on the chest kill the baby? The diaphragm tires out and it can't lift anymore. Does the baby cry? No. Wake up with your baby dead and your knee on his chest. How could you forgive yourself? Those were difficult, but I'm now going to go on to even more difficult slides from actual scenes. I've seen so many of these, too many. This is how the baby was placed. Why is there not a sheet on the bed? The police collected it as evidence. You know, the police don't know who's murdered their baby, so you get treated like a murderer until they realize it was an accident. We bring dolls of different races and let the family choose. If they want a doll of the same race, they have it. But if they want to distance themselves a little bit from the terrible pain by using a doll of a different race, they have that option. This is a placed. That's the found. That's a horrible death. Autopsy showed absolutely nothing. Sometimes the marriages break up after death like this. I hated doing this autopsy. It was so sad. Let me tell you about another case. This comes from the police report. Nine-month-old baby placed on a queen-size adult bed for a nap by his mother. She was visiting his 19-year-old sister. Her daughter was in training to be a nurse, and I suppose she felt that that made her daughter's apartment safe. She just put him on her daughter's bed for a nap. She went to check on him. She was found with his neck wedged between the headboard and the mattress and his body hanging down. It took him seven days to die at CHKD. He never regained consciousness. He had been born at 28 weeks, two months in the NICU. I have no idea what that costs, how many thousands upon thousands of dollars. Doing so well, 15 minutes between the time they put him down with pillows around him, thinking that that barrier of pillows would make him safe, and the time they found him like this. He didn't cry. He just died. How about another case? 26 weaker, 776 grams, saved. Went home on ap with an apnea monitor and a CPAP machine. Everything getting better. When this baby went home, 2,664 grams, now over 17 pounds. Been home for two months. Mom said, can I stop using the CPAP machine? Do doctor said, you probably better, but she stopped. It has an alarm on it, you know. Laid belly down with his head turned to the right. He's about at that stage of a normal three-month-old where children can turn their heads down, but they can't always turn them back. She heard him crying, went to make him a bottle, and when she got back, he wasn't breathing. Can you imagine? There's a little blood on the sheet from where it came out of his nose where he was dying. These are all tragedies. And even worse, they are all preventable tragedies. I chose these cases out of 63 I personally did in the past five years. I have hundreds of them in my files. In my lifetime as a medical examiner, 25 years, I have done 400 of them. Are you beginning to see why I care about safe sleep? I never want to do this autopsy again, but another one will roll in later this week. This week. I am always too late. As a medical examiner, I can never prevent the death that I'm informed about. But I might be able to prevent one in the same family if you go and teach people. If you can help me, please help. Dr. Gunther, thank you so much for all of that information. And again, thank you to Dr. Clayton. Um, we do have um, a quick question. Our, the audience that we're presenting to today are mostly child care providers, and we were wondering if you had any advice for them as they talk to parents and convince parents um, to use safer sleep methods. I'd like Dr. Clayton to handle that one because she is a pediatrician and I'm not. <laughs> Dr. Clayton, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, great. Um, certainly, as we give parents advice on safe sleeping, I mean, well, well, let me say this. Many of the parents in our region don't have their extended families around them. And so their child care provider is a very valuable and very important resource for information. And a natural opportunity arises to educate parents when you're talking about just general parenting advice that you're giving them. You know, especially if they say, well, my baby has trouble getting to sleep, you know, what do you think I can do? Or, um, you know, that's just a great opportunity for someone who's been educated about safe sleep to say, you know what, I do have some great advice for you about that. And it's very important to let parents know that placing them on their back to sleep is the safest way to help to keep, uh, is the best way to keep them safe, even if a baby has reflux. And that's where your own experience as a caregiver can really give valuable information to the parent. And you could, you know, explain to them you've taken care of lots of babies who've had reflux and yet they've all been perfectly fine laying on their back. They've never choked or had any problems with that. You can also let them know that, <clears throat> um, be aware that parents may be getting conflicting information from their family. The classic example is a grandmother who put all her babies to sleep on their stomachs and say, you guys turned out fine. <laughs> and that, I think, is a very hard piece of information for new parents to ignore. However, when families are traveling to visit other family members or when visiting relatives come to town, that is the perfect time to reinforce the, the principles of safe sleep for the family and remind them that babies should sleep on their back all the time, for nap time and for night time. And if, if a grandparent or someone else is presenting opposing information or pressuring a parent to let the baby sleep on their stomach, that's a perfect time for a care provider to explain that not, not only are babies better off sleeping on their back, not only, not only are they safer, not only do they minimize their risk of death, but a baby who's accustomed to sleeping on his or her back has a higher risk of death if they are unexpectedly placed on their stomach. And it can be very, very hard to talk about the nitty-gritty with families. You know, the, the ultimate worst outcome is the baby dying. And yet, parents do need to understand that that is the risk when children are in unsafe sleeping conditions. Thank you so much for addressing that. I know that that's a big concern with the caregivers um, is, is really how to, how to present this information to the parents and what we can do to help them um, make sure that their babies are staying safe. Um, we do Absolutely. have a few questions. Do you guys, do Dr. Gunther and Dr. Clinton, do you mind entertaining a couple questions? Oh, of course not. Okay. No, that's One of our first questions is um, whether pack and plays are okay if there's a fitted sheet on them and nothing else. Are those considered safe? Yes, those are considered safe sleeping conditions if they're not using the pack and play for storage, if they don't have any toys in it, and um, if they have just the regular flat mattress that came with the pack and play and no pillows. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, another question we have is um, how do you stop them from rolling over, and how does that play into safe sleep conditions? Hi, this is Dr. Gunther. The vast majority of children I autopsy are too young to roll over. The ones that can roll over can roll in the dangerous direction from face up to on the belly. But we almost never get a case where a child has died because they've rolled themselves over. We always get a case where the parents say, yeah, I put him on his belly. If you're going to have a child who rolls over and you're worried about that, if they're going to sleep on their belly, the only possibly safe place to sleep is an approved crib, pack and play, or bassinet with a flat, thin mattress that is not soft and squishy, that does not have a thick blanket or sheepskin on it that is going to be a safe surface so that child can't stick his face in that surface and accidentally suffocate. Also, Dr. Clayton, you think the pacifiers help because they prevent getting the face into the mattress? That's a possibility. People don't really know why a pacifier helps, but it's theorized that that's part of it. Maybe also the sucking action helps the baby's brainstem stay alive. I don't know. That's just a wild-ass guess. Excuse me, a wild <laughs> guess. 
I forgot we were being recorded. <laughs> um, another question. Thank you, by the way. Um, another question we have is um, if we can, if you can explain how sleeping in a swing could be harmful. Oh, I, I'll take that one. Uh, the children that I have seen who died sleeping in a swing weren't in the position that the manufacturers intended when they were found not breathing. They had slid down or slid sideways, and their little heads had fallen forward. They have weak neck muscles at that age and big, heavy heads. If you pick up a newborn baby and you don't support the head, what happens? It falls back, right? These children could not hold their own heads up and the weight of their own head squished their air pipe flat. If you can imagine hanging your head forward until you can't breathe, imagine what they went through as they died. They were not able to get a crying sound out. And Dr. Gunther, this is the same for car seats as well? Yes, I had a terrible case where the mother left an episode of domestic abuse and retreated to the living room with the baby and she fell asleep on the couch and put the baby in the car seat without the straps. And he slid down because he wasn't strapped and got his head stuck in a forward position where he could not breathe through his trachea because his air pipe was so kinked. So after being abused by her um, paramour, she also lost her baby. It was horrible. Great. Thank you very much again to both of our presenters. We're going to kind of conclude up now and finish. That's the word. Um, Again, we want to thank um, our presenters and then thank all of our uh, participants because we know how important this topic is. This was, you know, a very serious kind of webinar, um, but we, that was intentional because this is such a serious topic. And um, we want you to know how important child care providers are in the whole scheme of safe sleep because, one, we are, you know, helping children sleep during the day, but then we are also hopefully that resource for parents. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of information, so it was nice to hear some of the history a little bit behind it, and then from, from other professionals, not just child care providers, about this. Um, so as you go back to the children in your care, think about how your environment and your practices stack up. Are you meeting the guidelines that are given to us? Um, are you hopefully presenting these issues to your parents, maybe in enrollment or as, you know, you're, you're getting to know and building that relationship with families? Um, because we know that we all want the best for our babies, and we also know that it is our responsibility to act as that resource for parents as well. Um, you know, we know the American Academy of Pediat Pediatrics excuse me, recommends for the first 12 months of life, infants sleep alone, on their back, and in a crib. So just like they were saying, ABCs, alone, back, and crib, um, in their in ideally in the parent's room, but in their own separate and firm crib or surface bassinet. Um, they also recommend um, for child care providers, as ourselves, to receive education and implement these safe sleep practices in, in our programs as well. Um, and it's, it's also nice to have an idea and to have a written policy about what your safe sleep practices are, so that's something you can present to your families upon enrollment. This is how we um, take care of infants. This is how they sleep in, in our program. These are the recommendations. Um, so it, so it, that's something really to think about is having a, that safe sleep policy. Um, I also want to show you um, on our website we did have many handouts available to you that explain a lot of these things we went over and so I just want to mention a few. Um, there's a, a brochure, Safe Sleep for Your Baby. Um, there's also um, the safe sleep environment, um, and we also have, which is really nice, there's an order form on here for the safe, safe to sleep campaign materials. So the, the materials you're seeing here, some of the brochures, they also have like door hangers, um, other one sheet, you know, informational um, flyers. All of those are available for, from safe to sleep, and they're all free. Um, so you can get multiple of them and hand them out to your parents. I think that's a great educational tool um, for them to have for you to use you as a resource. So please definitely look into that. Um, there's even a phone number you can call to order or you know or send this in. So that's definitely a bonus um, for all of us to be able to use those materials and hand those out. We strongly, strongly encourage you to do that. 
Um, I also wanted to point out a couple other handouts that we have. Um, Virginia is starting um, the Baby Box campaign, and so there is a website there. So if you have any families that are expecting babies um, or have newborns, um, this might be something to look into. So definitely, this, this is something really new. So um, we don't have a ton of information on it yet, but we do have this handout that has more information and where you can find out even more information on that. And then, as always, at all of our trainings, we do like to provide you information on um, Virginia 211. For, please re, um, to have one place to get all your resources, um, the impact registry, and some scholarship information for everyone at the, our child care providers. Um, this, these are always usually great tools to use. Um, and I think, let's see if we have any more questions. Have we been answering them? Okay. Um, so I think we're going to conclude up, and I will let Lisa talk. I wanted to give another big thank you to our um, guest speakers. They were so valuable and knowledge, and I know that even personally for me, I learned so much today, and I hope that you guys will take some of this information, um, use it in your programs, but also share it with the parents that you, you have in your care. Um, so this webinar has been brought to you by the Virginia Infant and Toddler Specialist Network, um, and we want to thank you for participating. In order to receive your certificate for participation in this webinar, you must fill out the evaluation and either mail, fax, or email it to CDR. Again, in order to receive your certificate of participation in this webinar, you must fill out the evaluation and either mail, fax, or email it to CDR. If you have multiple people listening on the same phone line, each individual person must fill out an evaluation and send it back. Um, they will not receive a certificate unless they personally um, hand in an evaluation. Um, once your evaluation has been received, a certificate will be sent to you. Um, but please understand that there were over 300 people registered for this webinar, and therefore it may take um, quite a few weeks for you to receive the certificate back. Um, so please allow at least three weeks um, to receive the certificate um, before contacting CDR. The contact information for CDR is located on the evaluation that was sent to you after you registered for the webinar. If you have any questions, please contact your regional infant and toddler specialist. You can find out who your regional infant and toddler specialist is um, on our website, which is www.va-itsnetwork.org. Um, we do have one more poll before we finish up. Um, it looks like we have a poll. Which method would you like to use to share information with families? If you're still with us and you don't mind participating, um, just clicking on as many as you would use to share with families. Just give that a minute. And I love seeing that there are so many different resources and that you guys are willing to use all of them to share with the parents in your care. This is such a, such a great topic, um, like Paula said, to put into your policy and your handbook and really have that discussion from the very beginning. Um, I just wanted to mention again, in order to get the certificate, you must hand in or you must send in by email, fax, or mail um, the evaluation sheet that you received once you registered for the email. Or it's a handout. Or, or a handout, sorry. Um, the information that you, for where to send it is actually on the evaluation sheet. Um, our next scheduled audio conference will be on November 1st for directors. Um, for more information about this webinar, you can contact www.va-itsnetwork.org and look at the Professional Development tab or the scrolling banner for more information about registering for, registering for that event. Also, we want you to visit our website to register for our upcoming 123 conferences and our CEFL, Social, the Center for Social Emotional Foundations of Early Learning Trainings um, that we have coming up in the fall and spring. Thank you again for participating in this webinar, um, and we hope that you have a great day. Thank you again to our presenters. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to everyone. The webinar is now ending.